The Diesel Podcast. Developing innovation in English as a second or other language. Episode 80, English War Games with Sally Finkley. Welcome to Diesel. This is episode 80. We are your hosts. I'm Brent Warner. And I'm Michelle Reyes. Hey. And by the time you listen to this episode, I will be somewhere in the world. Oh, yeah. You can't say, though, yet. You'll say when Not you're, yet. You'll say when you're physically <laughs> actually there. I'll say it when I'm back home. <laughs> <laughs> How's your semester going, Brent? Uh, it's good. Uh, I am actively integrating chat GPT into my class. Uh, I was going to ask about that. And so it's, uh, it's all kinds of interesting. Um, there's how, how are colleagues, are colleagues aware? Oh yeah. It's going all, all none of my colleagues my, in my circles. <laughs> I, I just feel like we're going to hear about it, uh, in two years. Uh, <laughs> I'm hope, hoping that, um, it won't take that long, but it's interesting. So we've got some colleagues are, scared of it some are yeah. are really trying to get it in, get into it um if you go and listen there there's an episode on uh the other podcast the higher ed tech podcast the that, higher ed that tech. i do that uh yeah there's a couple ones about chat gpt now at this point so if you're mm-hmm. interested in kind of some integration into the classroom conversation so yeah it's going uh it's you know it's going to be messy in different ways but it is interesting what are, um we'll have to have an episode about what students are saying because i'm curious um what their thoughts are and where it seems to be um, expanding the most. And then I'm sure in a couple months, we're going to see other tools available for us to work with chat GPT and AI. I don't know. There are some things already going on. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that soon. I think it'll, it'll be a good uh, near, near it. It's a big, big, big conversation. So we need need to do more than just the one conversation on it, but, uh, but we'll jump into it soon. Uh, where are we today? What, what's up today, Michelle? <laughs> well, I am super excited today because I um, we have a special guest. Um, today we have Sally Finkley. I met Sally at work and she's an amazing educator. So let me give her a proper introduction. Right. Um, Sally is an ESOL instructor with experience teaching both K through 12 and adults in multinational classrooms with students from over 40 countries. She enjoys reading and hiking and hopes to visit all the Texas Hill Country State Parks this year. So she is also in Texas and she's from Texas, right, Sally? Yes, I am. There she is. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, a little bit about Sally. I had heard about this um, training she did um, and I couldn't attend her training on one of our professional development days. And it was called English War Games. And of course, I'm like, what? English War Games? What is this? First, it sounds like a game and I'm into gamification. So I want to I want to know more about it. And then I got a chance to observe in her classroom. And I wish I had been there the whole week because I really wanted to see it from beginning to end. And so this is an approach that I haven't seen. Um, and I think there's plenty of people out there who might get tons of ideas from this and I've been wanting to have her on the show forever. So we're really lucky to have her. So um, without further ado, Sally Finkley. Welcome (laughs) Sally. Hi. (laughs) So this is exciting uh, for, for both of us. Uh, Michelle told me a little bit about it, but she kind of kept me kind of in the dark because she's like, well, then we can ask more questions and figure it out when we're, when we're talking together. But it does sound really uh, interesting, this, this concept of of the war games. And, and I'm, I'm really happy again, this idea of just like, what are people doing that's innovating out there, trying to bring in different ideas into the classroom. And so, uh, I think it, it feels like a perfect fit. So, um, so, but I don't really know much about it. So, Michelle, I'm going to start you as mm-hmm. as the lead in the conversation mostly, and then yeah. I'll follow up with so, my own uh, my own wonderings and ponderings yeah, as we go. He he asks the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, actually, uh, first, I, I kind of would like to um, hear a little bit about your gamification approach, just in general, in your language teaching experience. Um, what is it that you do, and why is it? that you do it that way or what have you found? Um, One of the reasons I really like using gamification in the classroom, um, especially with speaking activities, I feel like it really increases that risk taking, which I feel with speaking is the hardest, hardest thing to get students to um, take risks in. 
I mean, you, you can get them listening and writing and they'll write everything, but with speaking, it's just like pulling teeth. And so if you can really <laughs> gamify that speaking part, um, that's the part that gets students starting to get really interested and um, getting rid of their inhibitions towards it. So I think that's my main approach is to focus on gamification of speaking activities, which is kind of where this came up. So what are English war games and how did you come up with this idea? So um, a lot of it was just thinking of how to encourage students to take those risks in speaking. But the, a lot of the games I use, like Kahoot or other types of online games or in-class games, were very disjointed. So we would play a game and we're done with the activity. Mm. And then we go on to another activity, we play another game, and we're done. But I really wanted to put it in a full context, like a situation um, and then I like to do uh, classroom roles. So giving students more responsibility. So I kind of thought, okay, how can I bring this all together, tie it in together um, with classroom roles, with speaking activities, games, where they're working together, collaborating, leading, giving them all of those opportunities. And I thought, war games. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've, I've seen movies with them. I have zero experience in the being in the military. I've got no formal training in creating games, <laughs> but and, I just, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt, but what is, um, what are war games? Because that's one term that I, I, I actually didn't know. It's a real thing. <laughs> it is. And I, I even had to look it up. It's like, well, does this make sense? So um, Peter Perla wrote a book called The Art of Wargaming. And his definition is any type of warfare modeling, including mm. simulation, campaign and systems analysis and military exercise. So I thought, okay, I can use that kind of backdrop and get them to focus on using their English in a situation, giving them missions, giving them a common goal to work towards where they're gaining points. Um, they're working on developing those collaborative speaking skills um, and also um, working together towards um, just becoming more autonomous in their learning. So um, did you say Peter Perla? Yes. So, okay, so the, so um, we're, we're going to put this in the show notes and um, so people can go check it out. But I like how you're talking about this um, concept of connecting all of those activities. And I think that you're right. I think with the tools that we have, we have a plethora of tools, um, especially tech tools, um, but they don't always connect. Right. And sometimes it, it feels like, oh, my goodness, we're overwhelming the students. Um, so I, I, I really like the idea that you are making it into like a pro it's almost like a project well it's like I don't a know if that's it's a continuous thing yeah. so it's all linked together so I, when you as soon as you said that i've like i felt that but i've never verbalized like okay now it's kahoot time all right now kahoot's oh, done, done. now the next and thing. Say another one another one yeah. okay how about a quizlet no okay how about you know whatever it is yeah and i i have really felt that like you know, it's like we have to, as teachers, we have to kind of weave that into the next activity and do it in a, in kind of a smooth transition, but it's not always smooth, right? And so <laughs> so I, I think what I'm hearing is that you're saying that turning your class or a unit of your class into this war game then makes all things uh, more cohesive and linked together from one activity to the next. It does, and it gives students just this context for using language, where it's not just, okay, I'm studying this grammar point and then I'm talking with my grandmother using this grammar point and then I'm talking <laughs> with my sister using this grammar point. It's, okay, how does this grammar point play out in real life? Mm. And so trying to get them to make that connection, um, even if it's something that they may never experience, it's just making that connection and giving them the broader context um, for something where they're working together, which is really what language is about. Can you uh, set up, like, what does the first day of class in this conversation look like? Like, what, what do you come in and show and tell the students? How do you build their expectations for it? Um, what are the first things you're teaching? Uh, is it, uh, are these parts movable? So it's like, hey, this week we're wanting to do these things, and next week we're going to do this. Or do you have to, have you built out, like, entire world plan? I, I, I don't know. I guess I just kind of want to, like, especially understanding it from the students on first day in, what are they seeing? 
Yes. So one of the first things I tell them is that we're going to be doing these war games. And they just kind of look at me like, huh? (laughs) (laughs) And I explain, first I explain the why. Um, For a long time, I did it without explaining the why. And they're kind of like, what? What's going on? Like, why are we doing this? Okay, we kind of get it. But I tell them, this is to practice your speaking skills. And this is to help you with your speaking skills, speaking with each other and like, okay, we get it. And they love it because that's the one thing that a lot of them struggle with and they want to practice, but they don't want to practice. Mm. And so I tell them the why behind it. And then I explain, I'll be giving you a situation and a mission. And throughout the week, each of the activities that I give you every day, they have these daily missions or things, mini missions. And then at the end of the week, they accomplish the overall mission. So everything we're working towards throughout the week is the kind of big mission, big goal. So one of the things that I really like here is that the approach to gamification, usually it's like points. What do you buy with your points? Um, it could be leaderboards, but here you you have tasks, tasks, and, and not everything is related to the, the, like the war game itself is not necessarily, necessarily related to the concepts you're teaching that they correct. Are you, or how, how, how does that connect? So there, there is a connection. So on the first day, I gave them the situation and the mission, explain the, the roles, the classroom roles. Um, but throughout the week, like one of the first missions on the first day, I call it the intelligence gathering. It's really question formation, teaching them how to ask a question. Mm. And they, if we may be studying a question formation grammar topic that week, or we may not, and I'll still put this in, but I may... If we're studying, you know, embedded questions, I'll ask them to ask embedded questions on the first day, or if they're just asking direct questions or yes, no questions. So I try to relate it to the grammar that we're doing that week with the question formation, but then also just tell them, be free, feel free to ask questions so that they can really work on that because that's one of those topics that almost every English learner needs to practice. And um, you mentioned the roles, what might um, sample roles look like in a classroom? So I give them a few different roles. There are a few of my core roles, but I try to give it to where all students have some sort of role. So sometimes I'll make up something smaller, divide the tasks in between people. But one of them would be the group leader. And they have the each role has a game part and a classroom part. So in the game part, the group leader is really deciding um, bringing everyone together in that collaboration to discuss how to accomplish the mission. And in the classroom, we'll sometimes I'll ask the group leader to choose someone to read or to um, decide which of the three activities we're going to do next. Um, So I try to give them that type of um, decision-making role. Um, The next one I have is security. So they're responsible for keeping all of the papers that I give them related to the mission, situation, mission. They have to keep it, you know, closed in a folder. Um, But the classroom side of that is turn off the lights and close the door as we leave. And then I've got a scribe. So that's the person who's taking notes about the um, decisions being made in the game. They're also writing down the homework for their classmates so they can kind of keep them updated if somebody misses. And then I've also got the uh, role of supply. So this is the person who's responsible for keeping up with all of the points and also requesting all of the equipment that they're going to buy for their mission, which is where they use all of the points that they gain throughout the week. So, um, and then his classroom role is to actually go get pencils for their classmates, make sure all of the pencils are returned at the end of the day, which has actually really helped me not letting my pencils walk off. So (laughs) it's been great. (laughs) So, uh, so, so then you're getting everybody into these roles and then I assume you have two, two teams of this. Is that, is it, uh, if it's a war, is that how, or does it get into like multiple teams all like, is it Stratego style or I, I don't know what's, what's going on here? So I've done it two or three different ways. One of the ways, the way that I go about it most of the time is by having the class work together as one team against the clock. Really the clock is what they're trying to be. They're trying to get through the mission by the end of the week. Um, I have done it two different classes when I've had two different classes where one class is, you know, phrase Landia, the other class is clause Landia. Um, <laughs> one is attacking the other. I get really creative with the names here. There's noun Landia, verb Landia, <laughs> but um, they have worked against each other like that. And then I've also done it within the class 
where they're on two separate teams within the class and they're working um, against each other within the class. All right. So, so explain to me some of these, um, these missions, right? Like what are, what are the actual missions that they're going on or that they're doing? Um, and then, and where does the language tie in with it for those? Okay, so um, I'll give you an example of one of the missions, uh, actually a situation and the mission. So the situation, I'm kind of setting up the backdrop, the story, what's going on in this country that we just made up. Um, So one of them was your village of Phraselandia has been hit by a hurricane. The roads are dangerous and you and your classmates have been called up to help, help keep the area safe. Your enemy Clauslandia sees an opportunity to attack. You must be ready to defend your village. So in this week, we were learning a lot of um, weather related terms. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We were learning about flooding and about hurricanes and tornadoes. So they're as they're learning this vocabulary, they're learning about um, how to use it and talk about it within their village. And also on the first day, I do give them a map of their village, of their country so that they can start talking about what are the risks, you know, the where's this where could the tsunami hit? How many people are in the path of the tsunami? Um, Where could a tornado hit? What could be the destruction and damage? So they're learning all of this language um, within this context. Their mission um, is a little bit different from the situation, but related is to one, prepare Phraselandia for a possible attack from Clauslandia, and also to keep Phraselandia safe and be ready to rescue citizens who need help. So we might watch a video of a rescue during a flood on YouTube or something like that, and they'll need to discuss it. Um, And then the mini missions throughout the week, the little quizzes that I give them are also related to this language for them to use. Okay, so they start doing these little quizzes and uh, watching these videos and kind of understanding. So that's pulling in, right? So that's a lot of the coming Mm -hmm. in for them. And then... um, how are you determining whether they are successful with their missions? Uh, like, is, is there a point scale here? You, you, you didn't mention that people are out buying supplies and some things like that. So it sounds like there must be like some other world building at the same time going on. Yes. So um, every day I give them points, one for um, doing their homework, um, another for speaking in English. Again, to raise that risk taking every every minute you speak in English is a point for the entire class. So um, and they have to be using the vocabulary and grammar within the speaking. So we'll be I'm still teaching, working on the grammar and vocabulary throughout the day. Um, and they're using that within the lesson. And then I'll give them a question at the end of the lesson that relates back to the mission. And so it's kind of this unstructured part where they talk about um, the mission. And then at the end of the week, what does that mission accomplishment look like? It's, I've done it a few different ways and I'm still working on um, getting it a little bit more hands-on, but it, it looks a little bit like a combination of Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know if you've played that Mm -hmm. and um, maybe a little bit of uh, different active hands-on activities, info gap activities. So um, a lot of times, like with this one, I gave them the mission. They had to have a discussion and the group discussion was a part of the planning mission. So they had to list all of the different ways that they were going to protect the village. And then they give that to me, I'm the narrator, and I narrate what happened the night before. And I tell them this, this worked, this didn't work. Um, there was a complication and I throw in the complication and the complication is really where they're solving in real time. Like, um, the bridge went out. Now you need to go rebuild the bridge using the vocabulary and the procedural vocabulary, the grammar they just used to say, step one, do this, step two, do this. And then if they, according to my rubric, if they can do all of the steps within the vocabulary, then they've accomplished mission. If they miss a part, then, you know, I have a, a scale kind of, if they get, you know, a three, then they got everything. A two, they missed the part where they needed attached to both sides or something like that, the vocabulary word attached. Um, and then I might give them a two and say it was accomplished, but you know, you lost a few shoes along the way or something like that. And then, <laughs> so we have a little bit of fun with this. Um, but as long as they do that and, um, get through the complication 
adequately based on the kind of scale that I have, then they've accomplished the mission. And then they go into talking about the uh, debrief or after action report where they use the past tense to discuss the whole week. Oh, okay. Nice. So, so then you're, you're tying it all up at the end. So just speaking purely of the mechanics of you kind of keeping track of these points, right? Cause so if you, let's say, so you said a, a point for every minute of English talking. So if it's an hour long class, they'll get, they're going to get 60 points over the course of the day. If you catch them speaking their own language, then you take away one point each time. Is that, is that how it works or? So I do it differently based on the levels of English learners. For beginners, um, I I might take away like 10 points. Um, For intermediate, I actually take away the entire hour. Um, They lose 60 points. (laughs) It is higher stakes. Um, Since I have my students um, for the whole day at our institution, um, if they're in an advanced class and they speak a different language, then they lose points the entire day. They go mm. back to zero Ooh. and they start over at that hour. So if they're, you know, five minutes from being let out and somebody says something in a different language, then they can only earn five points that day Ooh. if they continue in English. <laughs> so it's, oh, okay. So, so whenever it happens, you still let them collect points after that, but yes. it's, it's not like they're going to lose for the whole day, but it's like, okay, at the 30 minute mark, you said something. So therefore you can only get 30 points from here on out to the rest of the game. So it's, yes. it's how much it goes until the end. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Got it. That's a cool system. So, so that makes it, 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 it uh, motivates them to be careful about it, right? Yes. And, and better to make a mistake at the beginning than at the end. Definitely. So, and go ahead, Sally. Um, I, I remember one of my students, he was like, why are, why are we continuing on in English? And I was like, well, sometimes you're going to be speaking to somebody and they don't know your language. Like you really have to stay in English to explain this problem that you're going to face. And he said, my, my brain is on fire. And I said, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to um, point out here that so, so far we've talked about basically things that you could do with pen and paper and a board. And you've taken a lot of the mechanics of, of, of apps like quizzes, for example, where you can have teams, but then if a team makes the wrong choice, then the team goes back to zero but you've taken this and you can basically replicate that in a place where you might have very uh, little technology available or even um, internet connection. Yes, in fact, I've done this in areas with no internet connection. So um, it's, it's really something that you can adapt to your situation. You can use as much or as little technology as you want. Um, I did this in a classroom with pen and paper first and had all of the drawings written by hand. We did all the missions. I handed them to the students. They read them out loud. Um, They got really into it and really um, thought through a lot of what they would use the points for the equipment. And I have an equipment list and they use those points to buy the equipment. And I just, I keep it fairly generic, like um, ground support or air support, and they can, they can buy whatever they need for that. And I, keep even a category for other and they can create other equipment that they want throughout the week as long as they write it down. So um, they've gotten really creative with some of this and it really becomes after the first or second day, it's almost like the students are creating the story throughout the week. Yeah, I'm interested this is so, in that. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, it, it's very cool. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that, about like how the students take ownership of it and what they start like, because I, I can see this as something like you're saying, like you started off and get them going, but like then once they take ownership and once they start moving into things, as with all learning, right, that's where that's where the big changes start happening. So what have you seen your students actually do and what have you seen the, the ways that they maybe – maybe veered away from what your original intentions were, but it was still good or, you know, like, uh, how are, how are they taking it? So, um, one of the ways that, um, this, this kind of played out throughout the week, I w- I gave them a mission and a situation. And, um, one day I was actually having some trouble with technology, um, just dealing with some of the issues. And one of the students came and said, miss, 
it's it's Clauslandia. It's a cyber attack. And they wrote that into the story. I was really? like, okay, <laughs> like, we're going to learn the word cyber attack and we're going to go with it. And so we did. And that became a major theme throughout the week is that there's a cyber attack with these uh, weather problems and it caused a power outage. And they were, um, it, there was an engineer in the classroom and they were getting the engineer to solve the power problems. Mm-hmm. And they created a new role and said, we need, we need an IT role. And I said, okay. And so we created a new classroom role and a game role for him to go solve those problems. And it became a lot of fun. Mm. Have you, I'm curious, um, have you had any resistant or um, I guess, I, I, I guess in resistant students, I would think of like the more shy ones who might not feel as comfortable in what has been your experience in getting them to feel comfortable participating or, uh, or maybe that hasn't been the case. No, I've, I've definitely had some shy students and at first they were really hesitant. Um, but I tried to give them a role that, that they can have fun with. So, um, one of the roles was the timekeeper, which is, it's a fairly simple role. Um, they keep track of points and everybody likes the timekeeper because that person is giving them points. So it's a very loved role. (laughs) So I try to give them a role that everybody, everybody's going to want them to succeed in. Um, and so this person also tells me for a class time like when when break time is and they'll announce break time and I had this really shy student note and he he would just kind of look at his watch and raise his finger and be like yes it's break time I was like (laughs) no 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 we all want to hear break time like everybody wants to know that say it like everybody wants to know he's like okay it's break time it's like no 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 (laughs) and so he finally got to her he would clap twice and say break time and everybody go, yeah. And we'd all cheer. And he, he really opened up that week and really started to flourish because everybody was so excited when he accomplished his role. And so I feel like you can really, um, give students the responsibility, but also create that environment where everybody's cheering. Everybody's excited when each person does their job. I love the fact that it creates community and that they, I, again, I, I have had, I like, we always have had um, students who will encourage each other, but it's just harder when um, that person might not, you might not be friends with that person, but pulling them to accomplish this mission or missions together really creates that community and you care and you cheer and you genuinely feel excited that that student finally overcame uh, something that was challenging for them. Absolutely. And I've had, I've had some other types of resistance and a lot of it was because that, and this is what I learned early on was to tell them the why behind it. If you just go in and say, okay, we're doing war games, you're, you're playing this with this fake, you know, world (laughs) that I just made up and we're going to have roles and you're going to do this. And they're just like, huh? (laughs) why are we doing this? There's a lot more. I don't get it. But when I tell them, I set this up specifically so you can practice asking questions. You can practice your vocabulary and grammar in context. So you can practice those role um, discussion roles and polite speech. They, it, it suddenly starts sinking in. And then as we go throughout the first day, I really focus on modeling that with every class. And then it starts to, to really click. And I've had students a month later, I'll be walking down the hall and be like, Clauslandia, like, Phrase Clauslandia. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> you need to have like stickers made because they're going to be coveted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that we're, ta- we're talking to my school about like getting t-shirts and how hard, I mean, it's, it's a little pro- prohibitive Ooh, every time, but, like, yeah. <laughs> but I could see for sure people being like, I got my t-shirt, you know, like if it's a winning team, maybe got their t-shirt or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so Sally, so, oh, sorry. Ahead, um, for these, are are these typically like one week units, or or does it keep going throughout your term, or uh, how how long does this go on for? So I usually try to keep one war game to one week. I, I structure it around the week, just because I usually know I'm with a group of students for about a week. Um, sometimes I'll have them longer. Sometimes I won't. It just kind of depends. Um, I have done it to where I've kind of created this story and weaved it into the next week and we start a new mission, but I try to keep it about a week in part because, um, the attention of the students, like they can keep up with it for a week, 
But over the weekend, something happens. I think it's called sleep. Um, it's I'm the not human sure. reset button. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and everybody forgets what happens because I've tried to do it over two weeks, but it's just one week is probably the limit to what you want to do it. And then it gets two weeks just gets too complicated trying to keep everything up. Things change. So I just I limit it to a week. It seems to be the most convenient at least and then they're totally happy to move in to the new activity if it's second week Mm -hmm. or whatever else it is right but right but you're you're kind of have it uh cordoned off i guess in certain ways so it's like okay we're done with that that mission in in a in dungeons and dragons that would be like that campaign (laughs) is over now we're on the next campaign (laughs) type of thing yeah that makes sense oh we're not geeks around here i was just playing dungeons and dragons last night So I'm like, hmm, how can I tie this in? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking back. So I'm thinking back to my days at USC and there was this really difficult um, in my writing classes. It's a really difficult concept. Um, we had to study, read research about Fox domestication and, and then be able to write research about it. And I'm thinking, man, that was such a hard unit for everybody. And it, I think typically we took two or three weeks, but I'm starting to think, holy cow, I could probably do something with um mimic the scenario that the researchers actually had and have the one i think it was uh dmitry belayev who domestic who first started domesticating the foxes wow i remember this oh, <laughs> and and then they looked at dogs and they looked at how the process changed and i used to do a lot of um hands-on video recording and have them retell stories in groups and make posters and explain it and et cetera, et cetera. but i'm thinking oh my gosh this would have been so much more fun and then there's a unit on potato um the farm industry and and monsanto and how um gmo and uh i forgot what the the terms were but it was just they were just difficult and not fun language i mean it's research Mm -hmm. but i'm thinking i could totally take this and not call it war games but i could call it something else and i'm thinking to how many teachers can um their the limit is simply their imagination absolutely so, i've i i used to teach um uh a esl for science class mm-hmm. and i was just thinking how i wish i had this um i wish i thought of this about three years ago with my students because a lot of it was environmental focused and i was mm-hmm. thinking you know with the points you could start off with too many points you have too many and it's carbon footprints and you're trying to reduce them throughout the week with the class as they do their homework as they do things online as they you know do this community project out in the environment that would be so much fun and i i was like oh but that's okay maybe another teacher out there will do that No, that's okay because you're going to write a book about it and i'm going to hire you to go train and do these with students um so if a, if a teacher is listening out there and they want to try something similar, but they're not sure where to start, how would you, uh, um, what approach would you recommend for them to start with something like this? Because so, a week, a week long uh, missions it, w- for teachers who don't have a lot of time like us, <laughs> um, it's, it, it, it's just, it sounds overwhelming, but I, I, I think we can get past that. I think so too. Um, I would definitely start, I mean, with anything that you do in teaching with the end in mind, like what do you want them to accomplish um, in the classroom? Um, Is it hands-on? Is it uh, just kind of think about what that looks like and then work backwards. What things do they need along the way for them to accomplish that um, daily? Like, do they need to be doing homework? What kind of homework would help them do that? What kind of language do you want them to do? But also think about the classroom culture because I I developed these very intentionally to promote um, collaborative language, collaborative working together to get the points. So how can I, you know, as if I I were teaching environmental science or, language for science what words do i want them to know each day to really help them with that um, language mission at the end of the week is it weather related terms is it dirt related terms are we planting something in a garden where they need to instruct another student how to put that seed in the ground you know just think about each of those things and then break them down for each day Um, but i would also say don't overwhelm yourself Um, I started this because I really didn't want to be disjointed, but 
when I first started, I didn't try to connect everything all at once. I started with the end goal and the beginning and then slowly worked through, you know, taking that Kahoot quiz that was disjointed and rewording it. to now it's asking questions about Phraselandia and Clauslandia. And it's still asking the right vocabulary and the right grammar questions. But it took a while before I had adapted that to the mission. And so I would say just start um, with something where students are getting those points, accomplishing something at the end of the week, and then slowly add on where you can and um, be comfortable with it changing over time. Because I think I've learned more from how the students have changed it than, than how I decided to change it. Big time, big time. All right, so Sally, uh, I mean, this is there's so much to go <laughs> on here. There's a lot, a lot of different things. Um, this is a big ask, but uh, would you be willing to share an outline or some sort of uh, rough lesson plan with listeners who are interested in looking into this and maybe uh, using it as a way to get started or using it as inspiration for them to figure out their own way of doing something similar to this? Yes, um, I actually, I do have an outline of the week, um, things that I do each day. There are even some materials that are already online, like on Kahoot. If you look up EWG, you'll see uh, some of the different um, questions. And they're obviously with things that I teach, but you could look at that as an example of how to create a quiz around a theme. Um, and then I've got uh, a few different examples. I'm working on creating more maps right now for students to work through. Um, looking, I was looking at different, using different AIs, but I haven't found any that right now that are less artistic. I think a lot of the AIs out there, you know, you give it something and then it changes it into a picture, but it, it's more of an artistic rendering of that. And I'm looking for more of an topography like actual map <laughs> make so, me a fake country <laughs> <laughs> so i i'm working on that if anybody knows of anything i would I be do. interested my, my oh. niece is a cartographer so i will ask her okay <laughs> definitely <laughs> let me know <laughs> there we go there we go nice yeah. um okay so uh we will provide uh re links to resources and and maybe a couple downloads inside of the show notes um so that'll be diesel.org slash 80 uh the number is that right 80 mm -hmm. 80 <laughs> yeah. 80 yeah uh, we're so, old so awesome uh there's just so much to kind of start thinking about here and and i'm sure there's people listening they're like i want to get my hands on those <laughs> materials and get started <laughs> um and then also that the uh the book that you recommended too it, it sounds like it's a good way to get going peter Perla, right? Uh, yes, the art of wargaming. And I would say the first half is probably a lot of history. Um, the second half is a little bit more nuts and bolts. Awesome. Um, for And this is actual military wargaming, but I've adapted a lot of it and taken a lot of the concepts to my classroom. Well, I, I, I'm i almost thinking, Brent, um, a lot of this, you could, if, if you're a gamer out there and you're playing those simulation games, you could take any mission from there and build from there. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's something that would be on Call of Duty. Oh my gosh, that's something <laughs> that would be on like, I don't know, uh, some Nintendo yeah, 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 Mario game. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for sure. So there's a lot to play with here. Um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap up for now, but uh, but this is a great start and a great way to get people started. So um, so check out the show notes if you want to explore more. All right, it is time for our fun finds, and this time around, I have a completely superficial and maybe unnecessary, expensive, fun find. <laughs> it's the Gamma Professional Hair Dryer. And well, if you, I, I don't- I think dry hair very, is not superficial. <laughs> like That'll keep you from catching a cold, right? $350 is pretty superficial for a hair dryer yeah, if you could just use the fan, on your ceiling fan. <laughs> so um, yeah, I decided to splurge on a pricier Dang, hair dryer and I didn't think that it would make a difference, but it does. Okay. It really does. What does it it's do? It's like, uh, it, uh, <laughs> It's really quiet. So I know that. <laughs> no, it's really quiet and the way and it just dries so fast, but the the heat settings um do not they do less damage to your hair. So when it's sealing the shine into the, the oils, the natural oils into the cuticle of the hair, you end up with like really shiny hair. And um people comment on mine all the time. 
And so I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to buy myself one. And I am out there telling you to go spend your (laughs) hard-earned money on a hairdryer. So that's my fun find. No shame. Okay. Great. Good. Uh, Sure. Um, (laughs) All right. So mine is, I actually was inspired by a recent episode and this is, this is back to education stuff, but um, we were looking through some of the research and uh, one of the things that I found was this, this old book and it's small, it's not very big, but it's called the Goofacon. Um, And it's a, I found it on Amazon. It was only nine bucks. It's old. It's, you know, like I don't think they're ever going to reprint this, but, um, but it's pretty cool because it gets into like lang- they, they call them language goofs that students commonly make and how to kind of deal with them one at a time instead of, instead of trying to correct every error that students make. It's really about figuring out these kind of, this, this is the conversation of like global and local errors and mm. really helping students understand, but in a simple way. So it's, it just breaks down tons of little common mistakes that aren't necessarily a single grammar problem that you would just like solve what? it. Uh, so they, they have all sorts of things, but like, is it like the thing we talked about last time? Like the, I think so. Yeah. So like how like, do you use auxiliaries, so like the, the proper use of do and like a couple of basic rules around how do gets used, um, inside of here. I'm trying to grab something. Um, uh, it do passi- be like that sometimes. Yeah. Passive <laughs> sentence usage. And like, it gets into like, it gives these sentences like of the common types of sentences a student might say. So like, uh, it says the bread finished each cushion given by our priest, um, something like that. And then they talk about what the actual problem is because it's missing, you know, whatever it is. So sometimes they're pretty straightforward grammar rules, but sometimes they're kind of like weaved into other bigger problems, uh, but, but presented in a way that's meant to focus on helping students be more clear with their communication, not to fix every single issue. And so this is a teacher's book you know but um but anyways it's called the Goofacon. uh it's, if you can find it it's not particularly expensive although it is out of print i think that's from the 70s or something um, how did you find that about this uh because it was written by because uh, when we were talking about global and local errors i started mm-hmm. looking it up and then this book is part of where that conversation future episode, came out future episode. yeah so um so it's uh cool pretty good uh anyways if you can find it it's called the Goofacon. So what, do you, what do you have for us? <laughs> so um, I actually just started taking a drawing class. That's part of my solution for getting maps. Oh. Um, <laughs> Cartographers of the world unite. <laughs> <laughs> I would prefer an AI or something or a cont- cartographer. And I think my students would too. Yeah. Um, it, I, my, I draw like a five-year-old um, an amazing five-year-old, but, <laughs> um, I, I thought about going online for, for drawing classes or YouTube. And I was like, no, I've been in my apartment too much. Like I'm going to go out and meet people. So I found there's an art school nearby. Um, so I signed up for a class and I'm in there with artists and I'm like, oh gosh, there are actual artists in here. <laughs> so, um, but I've learned, I've learned a lot just on the first lesson. It's been a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. So the thing we must take away is that Sally is not afraid of taking risks because yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're talking about that and students and she's going out there with real artists and we're going to come back to these amazing seven-year-old map drawings <laughs> yes yes yeah. the seven-year-old one <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding awesome all right if you're giving us a shout out anyway tag us on social media we're on all the platforms mostly mm-hmm. mostly on twitter Mostly kind or, of. We don't know where we are anymore. <laughs> but um, how yeah. long is this conversation? And, uh, if we don't know where we are going to be. Yeah, we don't know where we are right yeah, now. <laughs> but we are. I mean, we're there. We just don't know if we're going to be there. So yeah. Um, Patreon got that. If you want to support the show, uh, the show notes for this episode is at uh, are at is are at. Oh, Can someone man. tell me if I should be? <laughs> That's a goofacon. <laughs> That's, That's a goof. Brent goofacon. <clears throat> uh, Diesel dot org slash eighty. That's the number eighty. And of course, you can listen to us at Voice Ed Canada. That's V O I C E D dot C A on the streaming uh, radio. Love it there. And uh, you can also find us that we are on Twitter at Diesel Pod D I E S O L P O D and I am at Brent G. Warner. And I am still at Ixy underscore Pixie. That's I-X-Y underscore P-I-X-Y. And if you'd like to get in touch with Sally, Sally, where can people find you? Um, I'm not on much social media, so you can email me. And I have an email address that's just englishwargames at gmail.com. 
Very That's the cool. perfect email for your book that you're going to be writing uh, over, <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> Love it. In Russian, thank you, is spasiba. Spasiba for tuning into the Diesel podcast. Thanks, everybody. Spasiba. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>